Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Lufkin, chair of the MIT Cardinal and Gray Society. We very much appreciate your uh, appearance this, this afternoon. I think it'll be a good program. Would like to welcome the members of the Cardinal and Gray Society to this afternoon's program. And in addition, the members of the Emma Rogers Society, an affiliate organization, we really appreciate your attendance. Uh, thank you for your interest in the uh, Omni Forum programs, of which this is the, the first of this month's cycle. The main stage program will be held at 7 p.m. this evening. It's not too late to register. The theme of the programs this month is service. Um, and there will be several other affiliate programs uh, complementing the main stage program this evening. Take an eye on your website and you will find uh, the rest of the details. Um, in addition, we will have the alumni forum program continues in February and March, in February with a program on climate change and in March on women in leadership. And the Cardinal and Gray will have an, a, a covalent program uh, supporting that uh, those at that time. Um, one thing I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, Cardinal and Gray members are welcome to attend reunions. Every year, as, an, as a member of Cardinal and Gray, you're welcome to attend reunions at MIT every year. There are special programs and there are special um, material and rationale for, for coming. Uh, once you've reached this stage in life, uh, we want to see you back every year. Tech reunions this year will be May 7th to 29th, which is Memorial Day weekend. So it requires some advanced planning. Today's program uh, is on service. We, we will have two speakers. Uh, Tim, Tim Mansfield is now celebrating, I believe, almost three months of service with MIT. Thank you, Tim. Um, your responsibility is the director of the MIT Vol Alumni Volunteer Experience. And in particular, you are the uh, director of the Better World Initiative. Uh, Tim will be speaking to us on the overall Better World Initiative and how the Alumni Association is focusing on service uh, and the documentation and memorialization of a service that MIT alumni perform to the, to the greater world as part of the Better World Initiative. Uh, following Tim's talk, uh, Pepe Fields, class of 1967, who is a very much involved a volunteer, in this case with the uh, Habitat for Humanity people, will be speaking to the Habitat for Humanity and his specific experience and the extraordinary work he's doing on their behalf. What I would like to do right now is pass the baton to uh, Tim Mansfield. Uh, Tim, you're on and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Rick, thank you so much and welcome to uh, our guests who are joining this afternoon. Um, in a moment, we'll be able to show a PowerPoint presentation um, there it comes. Um, I want to thank the Cardinal and Gray Society for hosting today's session. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting many of you in person, uh, of course, at Tech Reunions uh, in May. Uh, Rick, your jacket looks handsome, and I look forward to meeting you and others uh, wearing the, the, the Cardinal jackets uh, in, in person. Thank you, um, thank you, Tim, very much appreciated. Let me just point out something I neglected. Um, questions can be submitted on the Q&A box. We will answer all questions and uh, please feel free to comment, question and uh, challenge our speakers. Uh, that's what we're here for. That's what MIT is all about. Sorry, Tim, you're on. No, perfect. Thanks, Rick, good reminder. Uh, I'm here to talk about the, alumni, the Better World Alumni Service Initiative. Uh, as Rick said, I, I began my tenure at, at MIT in November, um, right when we launched the service initiative, which had been underway for a number of years uh, as uh, we began to close the capital campaign. Um, as uh, Kalen is putting up on the slide, uh, uh, up on the, uh, the slide, a few bullet points about the history of the, uh, the service initiative. Um, when uh, Campaign for a Better World closed, uh, reaching a $6.4 billion uh, closure. Uh, the board and, and other administrators began thinking about uh, MIT's impact in the greater community, uh, not only here in Cambridge, and uh, began looking at ways that we can represent service and community action uh, in a way that really helps tell a narrative about 
uh, the impact of alumni uh, to others on, in the globe. Um, one of the things that uh, we started to do uh, prior to my arrival was consult with uh, alumni and, and others on really what that might look like uh, on the website and how we might aggregate different projects and service opportunities for alumni to join. Um, since then, we've actually identified uh, close to 15 service ambassadors, alumni service ambassadors, who not only serve as uh, consultants and advisors for the service initiative, but they're also champions for the project and they're helping to uh, uh, encourage other alumni to participate in the service initiative. Um, like I said, we launched in November uh, and we've seen some great progress. And I want to tell you a little bit about the website uh, in a few slides, but here are the five ways that alumni are engaging with the website. Um, and I'll show you the link to the website in a moment, but these are the ways that folks, when they visit the website, how they're uh, choosing to engage. Uh, if they have a project and they'd like others to, to uh, participate and join their project, they can go on the website uh, to do so. Um, other alumni are curious about what is the service initiative and how can they learn more about existing projects, and they may want to join uh, some of those that are posted. You also have a way to uh, for folks to share a story or experience that they have. Um, up till last Friday, uh, we were accepting nominations for the first ever Alumni Service Award, the Better World Service Award. Uh, I think we're now over about 40 uh, nominations that have come in, so we're excited about that and received some really outstanding nominations for that award. Um, and the last way that, that, that folks can engage with the website is they can submit their own service hours, and that could be in group projects or individual service in their own community. Um, like I said, here is the website uh, where we house all of the, uh, the background and the information for the Better World Service Initiative. It's alum.mit.edu slash service initiative. Um, uh, first thing you, to access all information is you log in um, on the top right. Uh, you can click that about uh, Kalen. Um, there's a little arrow where you log in. Uh, so alumni can um, access all the information that's included on, uh, on the dashboard. Um, on the next slide, and thank you, Lizzie, for posting that there. Uh, there is, once you enter into the website, there's a, a, a dashboard along the top side. And if you, if, for those alumni that are interested in creating a, pro a volunteer project, they would click that link at the top um, and where they can input information, whether it's photos, dates, information about their own project um, for others to learn more about or join. As you'll hear in the second half of the presentation, Pepe Field did just this. He went in and created a project. He told the story about what his project included, and there's opportunities for alumni to learn about it and engage uh, in his project. Um, on the next slide, um, this is where folks, if they come onto the site and they click find a project, uh, if they want to search uh, what's out there and how can you learn more about what other alumni are doing and possibly participate. Um, there's filters that are included on that, that page. And we're about, and I'll mention this in a minute, but we're over oh, 34, 35 projects that are already in there and really some exciting opportunities that uh, alumni have included already. Only two months in, we're over 30, uh, 34 projects. Uh, already uh, listed. We're hoping to reach 50 uh, before the year's end, so we're on, we're pacing really well. Um, and then again, uh, Kaylin, if you click the link, if folks, if you, there's a button there for submitting hours, that's where folks would go in. Um, perhaps you're serving on a nonprofit board in your town, or perhaps you're performing volunteer service in individual ways. That's where any alum can go in and do so. Um, uh, I'll mention in a moment, that's where we're seeing less activity thus, thus far. We're seeing really high numbers in our project um, and our nominees, nominations for the award, but we're seeing less so far in the first two months for individual volunteer hours that have been submitted. Um, let's see, uh, this is really our progress to date. Um, and this slide was written last week and we're now, this list 32 active projects, I believe we're up to 34 right now. 
and even a, a, a few others that are in the queue that need to be reviewed before they're approved. Um, those projects are already represented in six countries and 12 U.S. states, and we already have over 800 recorded community service hours um, only two months in. Um, as I mentioned, really outstanding nominations for the service award. We will uh, present that award at tech reunions. Um, so we're working with the awards committee of the board to review those nominations and uh, make a selection. We'll make that invitation to the recipient and then bring that person back to campus uh, in late May. Um, so let me just see if there's a thank you. Um, so that's a brief overview of not only the history of uh, the service initiative, but also a few uh, glimpses of the website itself. Uh, after our second presenter talks, um, I want to be available to help answer questions about uh, the service initiative at large, but also about the website, because um, uh, it is still uh, in its uh, first you know, stages of life, and we're looking to make modifications and enhancements as needed, um, but we're really excited about the progress to date. Uh, let me turn it over and hand it over to um, Pepe Fields, class of 67. Um, Pepe is doing an outstanding project uh, with Habitat for, Habitat for Humanity that Rick had uh, mentioned. Um, I'm grateful for Pepe uh, introducing not only his work to the service initiative, but also the great impact he's, he's having on um, with caravanners. So Pepe, let me turn it over to you and I'll look forward to following up after your remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. And I'm gonna just leap right into this. Um, if I can figure out the technology here that makes it work. Uh, so good morning, colleagues. Um, I need to start out by saying I didn't start this initiative and my status within it is only that of a very committed volunteer. I occasionally have the opportunity to lead a team, but I am not part of the management of this organization, but I do love to talk about it. Uh, so it's an undertaking that is helping real people in the real world. On top of that, it's something my wife and I can do together. It's fun. We meet interesting people and we get to travel to places that we have not necessarily planned on traveling. So a little bit of background about myself. I was born in Colorado, I spent my formative years there. I'm talking to you from there right now. It's a nice, nasty, cloudy day outside. I've been volunteering in the community since I was 15. Initially uh, in Colorado, that meant the Red Cross, first aid, the local volunteer fire department, rescue squad. While I was at MIT, I volunteered with American Red Cross, local chapter, the civil defense, Mount Auburn Hospital, and uh, spent my summers volunteering. And my volunteering successes made me realize that life as a chemist, because uh, I'm class five, of course five, was not probably my best option. So on graduating from MIT, I enlisted in the US Army, got out of the Army, I married the girl of my dreams, who is now my bride of 50 years, uh, and returned to school to earn a master's degree in international management at the Haas School in Berkeley. And I practiced that discipline for all of my career. In 2016, my bride and I purchased a small recreational vehicle, a little motorhome. And since I'm not much of a person to sit around in empty parking lots and sip gin and tonics all day, uh, when the word reached me of human Habitat for Humanity's Caravanner program, we jumped at it. So since 2016, and notwithstanding COVID, we try to spend two to four months a year each building. Uh, with the caravanners. It's a remarkable experience in many ways, and I hope to get you excited about it today. So to give you another grounding on this, uh, of 128 million households in the United States, uh, about 37 million are on the order of 30% are uh, spending in excess of 30% of their income up on housing, thus they are cost burdened. Now that may not be a whole lot for those of you who are in California, but it does mean a lot for those of the rest of the US. Uh, but of those also about 17 to 18 million or 14% of the overall 
are severely cost burdened, which means they're spending over 50% of their household income on housing. Now, I'm not going to get too much depth with this, but I do recommend to you uh, this journal that was published by Harvard on uh, the state of the nation's housing in 2020. Uh, and there were four very distinct conclusions that came out of that. If we, one of them, if we look at the lowest second quartile, uh, we can see on the graph here, household income plotted against percentage of households that uh, in the non-white sector of our nation, over 20% of the households are behind on their rent or their mortgage. And so certainly there's a lot of insecurity about housing. And there are many barriers to entry. Uh, the cost of mortgages and houses aren't getting any cheaper. Uh, there are very low savings in that segment of the economy. They're, these people have existing debt, often including student debt. The upfront costs of buying a house are, are pretty formidable. And the safety nets under people who are, uh, are trying to buy a house or, or live in a house are really quite low. Um, so, Enter uh, some nonprofits. And Habitat for Humanity is a nonprofit originally in Habitat for Humanity, now Habitat for Humanity International, uh, which is dedicated to housing. It was formed in 1976, originally as a mission of the Disciples of Christ Church. It now reaches over 70 countries and has on the order of um, 1,400 affiliates in the United States. Uh, the mission originally was safe, decent, affordable housing. It's expanded to today's we build strength, stability, and self-reliance through shelter. So consequently, some of the things we do have expanded as well. Uh, we do other shelter-related undertakings and uh, community building undertakings. And also in the process, the mission has become non-sectarian. And those of us who work day to day are not uh, committed to any particular religion. Uh, in 2011, Habitat was the sixth largest home builder overall. And in 2020, it was the 20th. So we're not talking about a small organization here. It does have a major impact on uh, the economy. Uh, the, and the model that Habitat uses is really quite interesting and it's summed up my habitat is a hand up, not a hand out. Uh, we partner with families. They put in sweat equity. They go to what we call Habitat University sometimes to be learn what it is to become a homeowner. Uh, habitat keeps the houses affordable by significant donated uh, volunteer time, materials from corporations, and they provide very affordable mortgages uh, to the homeowners, either through their own mortgage funds or through uh, participating banks like Wells Fargo, often these mortgages are zero interest rate. Now, I'm going to uh, take a, a sidestep here for a minute and, and read a little story because I think it sums up uh, a lot of what I feel about the Habitat mission. And it's a story we've all heard, I'm certain, but I'll bring it to mind. It's called The, Stale of the, the Tale of the Starfish. And it goes like this. A young girl was walking along a beach upon which thousands of starfish had been washed up during a terrible storm. When she came to each starfish, she would pick it up and throw it back into the ocean. People watched her with amusement. She'd been doing this for some time when a man approached her and said, little girl, why are you doing this? Look at this beach. You can't save all these starfish. You can't begin to make a difference. The girl seemed crushed, suddenly deflated. But after a few minutes, she bent down, picked up another starfish, and hurled it as far as she could out into the ocean. Then she looked up to the man and said, well, I made a difference to that one. So um, in uh, September of this year, my wife and I had the opportunity to work in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And one of the houses we worked on uh, went to Lynette Rubio and her family. Lynette is a 30 year old, 30 something young lady who, who is a single mom and she has two children of her own. But in the process, she's also adopted her four younger siblings. So as a single mom, she's trying to raise 
six kids and she lives in a broken down two bedroom mobile home. Uh, two of the kids are in boxing. Maybe they pay for their boxing by cleaning the gym. Uh, and Lynette is working full time. And to her credit, she's also studying full time at the University of New Mexico, or excuse me, New Mexico State University. So you can see how a habitat would help this family, a habitat home would help this family immensely. And we don't always get to meet our homeowners, but when we do, they all have tales that are worth listening to. So let's talk about now the RV caravanners, which is a subset of the Habitat for Humanity uh, mission. Now, I said earlier that Habitat reaches the United States through 1400 affiliates. The affiliates are pretty much standalone. They have their own local boards of directors. They make their own decisions as to who gets the houses. They choose their designs of the houses. They do everything. Uh, they work on a franchise model from a Habitat. And so they have common branding and common uh, resources, but each affiliate is very much up, uh, on its own. The Caravanners program reaches across affiliates, and what we basically do is contract our volunteer labor out to the individual uh, affiliates. The program is in its 33rd year. It is completely and totally self-supporting. There are no paid staff. Uh, most of our bills are in smaller communities that don't have a ready pool of local volunteers. Uh, and as an example, I work frequently in Hobbs, New Mexico, and there the caravanners provide 90% of the construction labor for that affiliate. Each build when we show up is a one to three week assignment of a, a caravanner team. Um, and we work full time, five days a week, full time means six hours a day usually, so there's some good social time. Uh, and be before COVID, in the 2019, 2020 timeframe, there were about 6,000 registered caravanners working on as many as 250 bills a year. Uh, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we were led by volunteers. Our leaders all build. Uh, it's a pretty efficient organization. And unlike many that I've worked in, uh, it is not particularly political. So we don't have to play the political games. Where we build, um, the red dots represented bills that last week were posted for this upcoming year. We, the, the bills get posted as much as a year in advance, but are more often six months in advance. So we're expecting a larger number of bills uh, toward the end of the year to, to show up. Uh, because we're being cautious about COVID, uh, we're not showing as many bills as we might normally have. So I've also plotted in blue and in green uh, bills that uh, occurred in 2019 through 2021. Uh, many of these locations have multiple builds a year. So you can see of the 110 that I've got plotted here, uh, it's pretty easy to get to 250 a year. And you'll notice we don't have New York, Boston, uh, Los Angeles, or San Francisco here, uh, but we do have Taos, New Mexico, Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, and a, a great number of opportunities in Florida. So we have a saying that the caravanners are travel with a purpose. And you may be as a caravanner working as a framing carpenter one day on one house, kneeling siding on another, uh, as a painter on another, uh, being setting cabinets and hanging doors on still another. We hang sheetrock, we mud it, we texture it, we lay floors, we de detail window shades, we put in landscape. We are pretty much a full spectrum builder except for the licensed trades like plumbing, electrical, and HVAC. And even occasionally then we have our exceptions. Some of the tasks that we do are unique. And Taos had the opportunity to build a house with Adobe. And in Santa Fe, I got a chance to build coyote fence. Uh, so I really love the variety and we don't get labeled as just a carpenter or just a drywall. To be a caravanner, you have to be at least 16 years old. I think my grandson may hold the record. Uh, his first build with me last year started one week after his 16th birthday. But more than, more than the youngsters when we see our retirees because they have more discretionary time, uh, many if not most of the caravanners are retired 
Our average age on a build is about upper 60s. We have couples, we have singles, and because we're all traveling in, in recreational builder vehicles, we also have non-builders. Uh, many of our caravanners come from service professions, fire, police, military, but there's no real pattern. Uh, the leader of our group is a retired doctor. Uh, we are almost equally split between men and women, but perhaps we are outnumbered by women. Uh, so uh, there's no particular requirement of age other than being over 16, no particular requirement uh, other than wanting to have a like mindset and finding some good social compatibility. A couple of years ago, we built in Santa Fe. This is a not a typical place to park our rigs, which is the Santa Fe rodeo ground. What was atypical about this picture was that the major thunderstorm which was coming through, uh, our rig is the one in the middle with the white windshield. Uh, so we took quite a brunt of the, uh, of the storm there. But what you need to be a caravanner, what you really need is you. You need you, you need your recreational vehicle, and your RV needs to be self-contained. You don't need experience, you don't need talent, you don't need skill, you don't need tools. We'll help you with all of those. You need to be mobile enough to get safely around a construction site. Uh, you do need to have a proactive safety mindset. We can help you with that. Uh, you need to register for a build online, receive a confirmation, uh, and show up on site at the right time, right place. When you sign up for your first time, they'll have a background check performed. Uh, and as of the beginning of the year, you do need to be fully vaccinated against COVID. For every must here, there are some exceptions. And I'll give an exception of a young lady who uh, had been building for some time. She was up for a knee replacement, didn't feel safe on site, and was thinking she was just going to have to hang out and not be able to contribute. The affiliate figured out what the problem was. They said, come on into the office. There are more elements to building than just swinging a hammer. We've got to pay the bills. If you will do the three-way match, then we can sign the checks and get all our materials paid for. So everybody, everybody benefit. So we've got lots of opportunity for everybody and what they're capable of doing. Adjacent to the caravanners, there are a couple of other programs that we participate in. Uh, one of them is called the Collegiate Challenge we call it the disaster rebuild. Uh, the Collegiate Challenge takes place every spring. There are university students who would rather build and contribute to the community than lay on the beach and get drunk. Uh, these young people are admirable uh, and where they may be lacking building skills, they would more than make up with their enthusiasm. The caravanners get invited to the party if you, speak, if, if you care to speak that way to corral this energy and in some cases help the students learn. Uh, they really do renew your faith in the next coming generation. They also can make you pretty, pretty tired. Not as much fun, but certainly important to disaster rebuilds. Habitat rebuilds in areas of recent disasters, usually not, we're not a disaster response, but a disaster rebuild organization. So we come in two to three years after the disasters occurred. My wife and I were able to build in June in Paradise, California where the fires wiped out the entire community in 2019. And we were able to work on the first new habitat house uh, going into paradise. I'm the guy in that picture in the upper left-hand corner in the blue shirt. Uh, and uh, although it not, may not be as much fun, there are some other challenges and the rewards are uh, pretty important. So we're achieving this and, and and one of the questions we ask ourselves all the time is, why do we build? And the answer to me is the contribution and the satisfaction. And to me, the most satisfying part is to go back to where we built before and see the kids playing in the street and being safe. Uh, I like just watching the school bus and let the kids off after school. Uh, and that means a lot to me. We don't often meet the families or always meet the families and we rarely have follow-up but occasionally we do. And I'll finish with a short story, again in Hobbs, New Mexico. In 2019, uh, Halloween evening, I was out walking my dog uh, through the habitat area. We site our rigs where we build in Hobbs. 
And as I was walking along, I heard a couple of young boys say, let's go get the caravans. And I thought, mm, probably better get back to my rig and get ready for some mischief. So my dog and I turned around and we went back to the uh, rig. And sure enough, the kids showed up about 15 minutes later. And to our surprise, they brought candy to us. I can't re recommend this initiative too strongly. Uh, and we heard about it through word of mouth. If you have the opportunity to pass it along, I think that uh, you will find people who genuinely are satisfied with what they can contribute to the communities and knowing that what they're contributing is making a difference. So thank you very much. Pepe, thank you. The depth of your passion, the depth of your engagement, uh, two to four months a year is truly, truly striking. Um, I just, we, we stand in awe of someone with your level of engagement. Um, one, one story that I would take, which really complements uh, what you were saying, is that I read recently about a circumstance in which the financial stress of the people who are at the lower income levels is exacerbated by something that, to be honest, many of us wouldn't even think of. Um, homes for people in the, at the lower, lowest income levels are generally not formally transferred by the, the, uh, you know, the processes by which homes are purchased and sold and mortgaged and memorialized in government records. They're passed down from generation to generation by families. And as a result, people who live in homes like, like this do not have the, the documented assets that would enable them to, to borrow funds to actually get the financial uh, resources that they would have to, in order to, to improve, to rebuild, to expand. So again, it's something that society has not provided the tools for people in those circumstances to, to succeed, and that is lamentable. Um, Tim, let me, let me start. There's a se several se series of questions, but I think the one that I believe is on the uh, minds of most of us is the concept of, that we're talking about here is, involves um, us, the alumni, telling ourselves, the alumni and the, the, inst the Institute about all these wonderful things we are doing. They are being memorialized and hours are being recorded and events are being, and activities are being do documented. What is the, the vision here, other than telling our, patting ourselves on the back for a good job that we're doing? Uh, to what extent are we telling, are we asking, uh, do, you, do you see MIT using this information as part of a broader uh, communications campaign, or I'm not even sure what the phrase is. Can you, can you respond, please? Yeah, Rick, I think that you, you raised two uh, concepts that, that we've considered as well. One is, of course, the narrative and the story afterwards is, is being able to describe uh, the global impact that MIT alumni have in their community. And two, perhaps as part of a, a more of a, a broader uh, articulated campaign after year one. Um, I think that this is really, the initiative was built following the success of the campaign as a, as a means to sort of galvanize alumni to not only learn about what others are doing, but to get engaged in their own community. So it's in fact also a call to action. You know, how many of us might not have heard about Pepe's uh, um, work that he's doing, but also about caravanners nationwide. There are plenty of alumni that not only perform service in their communities, but there's so many others that say, I have, a, I have a, an, an urge to help, an urge to make a difference. How can I connect with other alumni to hear what they're doing and find ways to get involved? Um, so, if, Pepe, I, I, I was so impressed with the, the work that caravanners are doing. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, over 45 attendees for today's session that we might have a handful that might say that's something that I can really uh, look to, to do. So, Rick, I think that's part of it. I think part of it is actually finding ways to connect alumni with each other okay. on service opportunities. Um, while I have the microphone, and I, this is how we're answering questions, um, Pepe, can I, one that came in that, uh, Rick, if you don't mind me, only because I had invited the attendee to ask during the Q&A session. Um, Rick, are homes, are these home builds also initiated other than, uh, I'm reading it the right way, 
other than USA, like in developing or underdeveloped countries, i.e. Pakistan, Bangladesh, et cetera? Uh, are we seeing those the types of projects uh, nationally, also internationally? So the question of me is, are we doing that in the other countries? Uh, that's, that's and the right. answer is the caravanners do not, because it's really hard to get your RV to Bangladesh <laughs> or to, to Fiji. But um, that said, uh, Habitat has a presence, as I said earlier, in over 70 countries. And if you go to the Habitat website, there are opportunities to go on international builds uh, mm. where the actual uh, logistics are planned through uh, Habitat. There are volunteer coordinators who take teams to different countries and build uh, their, in their particular style. And if I can add to that, there's a park in America's Georgia where Habitat was started, where they have a number of houses built in the style that they build in each different country. So that you're not duplicating an American 1800 square foot three bedroom house in Pakistan, but they will be building with Pakistani type materials and Pakistani structure that fits in with the Pakistani way of, way of life. It's a fantastic little park to see, but if anyone's interested in participating internationally, I commend you to that organization, part of, part of Habitat. The other dimension to that might be for MIT alums who might live in those countries, presumably they could reach out to the Habitat programs in those countries themselves to participate. Right? Absolutely. From the Absolutely. USA. Okay. Thank you. Um, you, Lizzie uh, Army, our Alumni Association contact, has posted on the website here, the connections are on the chat function, the specific uh, URLs leading to the uh, uh, these volunteer programs. So feel free to take a look at, at those and uh, link and connect with those who you have on record. Um, one question specifically comes, comes to us. Um, how are the recipients, and this is to you, Pepe, how are the recipients for the home selected? Is there an application process? Once selected, how long is the wait? That's a very good question. Uh, it's a little bit outside the scope of caravanners, but I can, I can uh, we, we build, we don't select. But in generally speaking, each individual uh, affiliate has its own selection process and its own selection board. Hmm. Uh, they operate within, with people in a specific area that they represent. The selection process generally has to follow a, an overall habitat format, uh, but it is basically a forced ranking based upon uh, need, based upon ability to pay a mortgage, based upon uh, the, a family that can be uh, get a step up uh, by having a home. So. Uh, it's very, very important that the, the people display their requirements and the reasoning when they do the application process. Uh, they sift through uh, the applicants and then we'll select uh, usually one per home and a couple of, that, of, of uh, alternates. Um, and then it takes a while to get the houses built. It's not like yeah. uh, you hire a contractor, he comes in and builds a house in six months in six months, but uh, yeah, there is an application process and, and you would go to your local affiliate and inquire as to what their process is. Thank you. Uh, we've also posted on, again, in the chat feature, uh, some uh, links of interest to Habitat for Humanity, its history and the Caravaner program uh, specifically. So please uh, feel free to uh, follow up on that. Um, let me continue to take a look at some of the questions here. Um, uh, someone has specifically asked uh, service hours. Are they year to date or weekly? How are they, uh, how, do they, how, they how is that managed in terms of the recording process? I yeah. think Pepe, that's the question came in regarding the website. So that's, I'll help answer that. Uh, the recorded hours that we have right now are 800 plus recorded hours. That's year to date. That's uh, those that have been submitted okay. since November till now. Um, the way I answered is that on June 30th, the end of our fiscal year, we'll put a marker in the ground and we'll evaluate our progress and success to date in year one. 
This initiative will continue beyond June 30th, but that's an opportunity for us to be able to measure our success and evaluate our progress towards goals. Um, we're looking to reach well over a thousand volunteer hours. We're clearly doing well with uh, those that are recorded hours thus far, but like I mentioned before, there are so many people that are performing volunteer service in their own communities. And although they may not be part of projects like Pepe's or, uh, or organizing other efforts that other people can join, we want to hear about the good service that people are doing and encourage them to visit the initiative website and to record those hours, not for purposes of competition or for, as you said, Rick, before a proverbial pat on the back, it's really more of us to be able to measure our progress and be able to speak to the broader impact that our alumni uh, are making. And that's just one metric is really volunteer hours. It's striking. We've had quite a number of questions all relating to the international dimension. So it doesn't really uh, directly address your, your particular activities, Pepe, but it's obvious that the audi our audience in general feels strongly that uh, uh, the, the need, while it's, it's real and very, for volunteer and particularly in the Habitat for Humanity area is very real in the US. Uh, the international need, I guess, obviously there's specific reference to the islands in the South Pacific uh, now is, is terribly, terribly real also. Question of how can that be addressed by uh, volunteer organizations? That's a tough question. I'm not sure. It's a tough question. I've spent most of my career internationally uh, yeah. and uh, I understand those concerns very much because I've experienced them firsthand. You live a couple of years in Brazil and all of a sudden you realize yeah. the housing requirement is, is very, very different there yeah. uh, and, and probably much more acute. Um, unfortunately, caravanners can't get to Brazil very easily, uh, <laughs> but I, the uh, Habitat for Humanity International uh, website has a locator function. Uh, mm -hmm. So if there are anyone is interested specifically in a specific country or a specific affiliate within the United States, uh, you can go on the site and you can get the contact information for those those places. Those places. Thank you, uh, Tim. One question in terms of just the, the logistics of reporting: um, We are asked, can the hours go back to July first, twenty twenty one, for projects that were already started or only starting November first, twenty twenty one? Yeah, I saw that good question come in, and uh, my answer is: I think we want to be able to be as flexible as possible. I think there are some good projects that, that had begun uh, at the end of last summer that we'd love, we'd like to be able to include retroactively before the launch of the uh, service initiative. So I don't think we wanna be in a position that we're saying, no, those good service projects that began in late summer, early fall can't be included. Um, and that we'd encourage folks to go ahead and, and log those hours in. Um, and if there's any challenges, I'm happy to answer them individually. But um, I think that's, the, that's the posture we should be taking for any good service project that began prior to the launch of the campaign. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I, Pepe, uh, people obviously are intrigued by your, your life <laughs> and the style that you have adapted. For example, we, we have been asked, what, is a typical, what does a typical day look like for a cam caravan volunteer? Actually, that's a really good question and I probably should have covered it. Um, so, the individual affiliate is required to provide certain things for the caravaner bills. One of them is an on-site supervisor. And the on-site supervisor is usually sort of uh, a person who is very skilled at building and also relatively skilled at teaching. So we usually circle up about quarter to eight, maybe 7.30 in the morning. Uh, that all the, Everybody who's going to be building, uh, the local volunteers, as well as the caravanners and the site supervisor, uh, will get together. We'll have a a, a brief safety talk. Uh, we will have some kind of inspirational message, uh, and then we will talk about what needs to be done on the uh, on the build sites. And we'll divide ourselves up approximately how we want to go about doing that. Uh, we may circle up on the actual build site, or we may circle up a block away from it, depending upon the particular circumstances. So uh, by eight o'clock, we're on the build site, we're pulling tip tools out, we're pulling materials out. Um, depending on what the tasks are at that day, we usually, uh, caravanners are usually between two and eight rigs on a site, which means mm -hmm. between four and 16 people. The average is usually around four or five. So there are eight to 10 caravanners 
uh, used a couple of extra uh, local volunteers there. We'll be working in teams, teams of two or three, maybe four. So I have several tasks going on at a given time. I have a break at 10 o'clock for 15 minutes. I have a break for lunch for half an hour. By three o'clock, we're picking up our, our tools, putting them away, making sure that our work site is clean. By four o'clock, we're back at our rigs. By five o'clock, we're sitting outside uh, with uh, some kind of libation in hand, uh, discussing the day's work and uh, honestly doing some planning for how we want to go about doing the next day. I've been quite surprised uh, the latitude that the caravanners have in some of the decision making. You would think it would be all dictated by the affiliates. The caravanners have a really good reputation. Uh, a couple of years ago, the site a supervisor got ill. He handed me his credit card, his fistful of keys, and said, take care of it. So uh, the general, generally the days fill that, uh, that routine. We have two days a week off usually. And that's, we, we, my wife and I use one as a maintenance day. So we do our shopping, our RV maintenance, our, our clothes washing and all that good stuff. And when we take one day and go out and do something, we have some fun. Pepe, you clearly enjoy yourself. I hope that uh, the story is infectious enough that uh, I'm going to ask one of my colleagues here to uh, post your email address. And uh, if you don't mind, and we'll see if we can get some specific uh, uh, people who might want to approach you directly about uh, just looking for introductions into the process. Because I'd be happy to have any any questions. It looks like fun. It looks and, like fun. And no Rick, isn't and, and isn't that if if that ends up being the case where other alumni are finding Rick, are finding Pepe, and 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 engaging in caravanners, isn't that ultimately what what this service initiative is really about? Uh, the families and, and impact that uh, Pepe at, and others with Habitat for Humanity have found is outstanding. But to be able to engage other alumni together and, and perhaps find meaningful ways for them to be involved is really why the service initiative was built. And uh, I, I'd be happy to see those connections um, evolve. I, I like your, your focus there, Tim. Something that I'm not sure had, had come through earlier is that the, the logic here is all focusing on getting MIT alums to recognize what can be done and what can be done together uh, and to the, the, the self-satisfaction and the rewards that come from this kind of volunteer activity. Um, I thought right. I was you know, sort of caught in the terms of why are we memorializing these, these numbers and these hours? But I think that the broader story is what can we tell people and share the, the satisfaction, the in, engagement, the, the, the fun that we have about this kind of volunteer activity and to make it infectious enough to, to, share, with, to share with others. Uh, agreed. I think the, the, agreed. The, the service initiative website that I walked through some slides before is really a tool and a means to the end. It's really a way to aggregate all the good work that people are doing, share information about each other, nominate good people that are doing outstanding service. That, that really is the tool, the means to the end to be able to really just represent that impact that, that MIT have, not only in their communities, but with each other. So uh, agreed, Rick. I'm glad when you and I talked a few weeks ago about the service initiative, we were able to wrap our heads around that in the right way. Okay. Um, uh, Lizzie, can you post uh, Pepe's uh, uh, email address on the, uh, uh, the, the chat function, uh, please, so that people could uh, figure out how to reach out to him directly? I think that's something that uh, can be done, and I'm not sure I know how to do it. So I'm going to leave that in the hands of the uh, people who understand the system. Um, beyond that, um, I'm not seeing any more questions and we are not here to just uh, take time. Um, Tim, do you have any, uh, any closing, closing remarks before we uh, uh, bring this? Uh, just a closing comment. I'm glad that the questions came in about uh, international uh, yeah. reach of Habitat for Humanity. This is a more of a plug to the uh, alumni forum. We had an event uh, last night. Let me get my days together. Uh, yesterday, uh, with uh, alumni in Europe uh, service uh, event last night where we had alumni speaking about their service project, much like Pepe did today uh, in an event last night. And there are, as you mentioned earlier, a series of events coming up as part of the alumni forum on service this month. Uh, so Rick, uh, I just want to signal that this is one event part of others. 
Um, but a big thanks to you and the Cardinal and Grace Society for, for, for hosting and sponsoring today's event. This is, uh, I'm, I'm touched to hear about Pepe's program, uh, but also the good questions that came in. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And just to remind our audience, the, 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 the this week, this month's program is at 7 p.m. this evening, and uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, to register, and uh, we'd be pleased to see you there. Uh, Pepe, did you have any uh, further? No, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to the group, and I look forward to meeting you on a bill someplace. Okay. Um, the only thing I would say that the, uh, the link for the Pepe's address has been posted, uh, email address, Fields Jose A, F I E L D S. JOSA at alum.mit.edu has been posted. Feel free to pick it up. Beyond that, I'm going to thank everyone from, for their participation and attendance and wish you a good evening, good afternoon, and a good evening, and hope to see you as many as you can this evening. Take care now. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.